Well, welcome to Show Me What You've Got. Um, we're just going to run through a bit of a um, high-level overview of what we're going to be um, seeing and sharing today, and a bit of a background of um, what we've been up to in the past six weeks, which which got us here. Um, there's a little agenda. And uh, yeah, first of all, just as we as we work through today, uh, this has been shared with the cohort in in Slack, but um, we will proceed through the order in which the slides have been uh, arranged in which people have uploaded their content. Um, like I referred to, um, some people have other places to, to go and it's getting late in some regions of the world. Um, so we'll, we'll stick in that order. Um, I'll share my screen and unless you'd like to share yours, just let me know and uh, you can take over sharing responsibilities. I think we have one or two demos scheduled. Um, so people will be sharing their screens and working through what they've created. Um, in the top right hand corner of the screen at the moment, you'll see this QR code and, and that'll appear a few times throughout the presentation. Uh, what that is, is there's there's a, uh, some, some awards that are gonna be given out based on the work that's uh, happened and the presentations we're gonna see today. So if you scan that QR code, it'll come up again at the end of the presentation and maybe once or twice um, before then. And that'll give you a list in, in which uh, you'll have some options to vote for a variety of awards um, from best technical presentation, best collaboration, most creative. There's a variety of, of awards in there. And those winners will be announced tomorrow in our final weekly sync of the cohort. Um, this cohort, we had 34 residents, I believe, from four or five uh, different organizations and uh, spanning regions from South Korea, across North America, all the way to Western Asia and Middle East. Um, we met in Lisbon for COLA week and we'll have a, a, a really short but very cool video recap that we'll see in a second. And, um, the first three weeks of our six week cohort was mostly focused on learning the content of IPFS, IPLD, LibP2P and Filecoin before meeting in Lisbon. Um, I've sort of jumped in, into a bit of what, what Launchpad was right there, but uh, for those of you who are joining from across the network who maybe weren't involved in the last cohort or heard about Launchpad in, in Lisbon, um, maybe at one of the events, Launchpad is a six-week full-time onboarding program designed to train, develop, and match technical talent at scale with opportunities in Web3 across the Protocol Labs network. So we've got scaling, hiring, onboarding, and we build community. And the images at the bottom there are the wonderful team that I get to work with that make this happen. Um, some of them are on the call here. Um, if I just run through the names quickly, the team is growing. But from the top left down to the bottom right, we've got Christian, Molly, Brooke, Carla, Walker, Lindsay, Snow, Katie, Hannah, myself, Enol, and Marco. Um, and none of this would be possible without the contributions of those team members. So um, when you see them, thank them. Um, drop them a message on Slack to say how wonderful the events were in Lisbon or how uh, meaningful the um the, uh, the the interactions were or the, or the quality of the curriculum. Um, and um, yeah, this is cohort V6. We started cohort V7 this week as well. So it's been a bit of a whirlwind for uh, the, the people whose who's, uh, faces are on screen there. Um, and we're excited to, um, to, to host this uh, event today and, and um, share what, what's been created with the network. Here's a, one of the photos from, uh, from Lisbon. Um, there's the, the group that uh, managed to jump in Ubers, shuttle between events, uh, between hotels. And uh, this might've been um, the day where we had the most people uh, at one time. So thanks for uh, everyone for, for managing your time and, and trying to make the sessions. And let's move on. Um, to show me what you've got. We're gonna run through this. Um, like I said, if you'd like to share your screen, just let me know. Um, yeah, let's do it. Sarah's up first. Hi everyone. First of all, a huge thank you to the Launchpad team. Um, it was an amazing experience. And I was at a dinner party the other day and someone asked me what decentralized storage is. And I gave an answer that actually sounded like I knew what I was talking about. So thank you to you guys. Um, and it was so nice to meet everyone in person. So what a wonderful experience. 
So for my um, project, I thought that I would do something that's directly related to my role. I joined recently as the managing editor as part of the Spaceport team. And um, one thing that we, part of my scope basically is to help um, increase the cadence of content on the Protocol Labs blog. So when I joined, it would be updated once every maybe four to six months. Um, and then there would be like a flurry of posts and then nothing for a little while again. So I wanted to uh, help introduce a bit of structure and we thought to do that by doing um, a low lift at the beginning. Uh, Protocol Labs has an amazing archive of all of these talks that have happened through funding the commons and things like Lab Week and uh, PL Summit. So we thought to uh, repurpose some of that in through the written word. So we created a series called Transcriptions. And the idea is to take some of these talks and then um, do kind of like executive summaries or key takeaways so that someone who's really busy and doesn't have time to watch an hour long talk of on a, you know, a really um, technical deep dive can just take a, a glance, um, skim through something and then go through a full transcript that can uh, includes video timestamps to take you to a section of the video that you might want to see. So goal number one was to identify around 10 talks to begin with, um, and that includes topics that are more introductory, things like uh, the importance of public goods funding, and then moving along to more um, technical things, eventually things like FVM. So one of the challenges was that there are so many talks and it's difficult to play favorites. So of course, every um, different team thinks that the, the talks that they're curating are the most important ones. And we, we wanna make sure to pick and choose a nice selection. So we ha I had to kind of meet with different teams, talk to them about which talks we should highlight and then create a structure. So we aim to publish every other week until the end of the year. And then starting in January, ramp up to weekly. Um, one of the learnings was that the talks are super long, but they're full of value and insights. So how do you take something that's an hour long where so much of it is interesting? So rather than just straight transcripts, we did an executive summary at the beginning that includes um, key takeaways, top insights, maybe really interesting quotes, and then have the complete transcript below for whoever wants more. And the next step for us that we're excited to do is um, basically transcriptions covers a lot of talks that deal with um, theory or uh, high level topics. And we thought to complement that with interviews with founders from within the PL network who are you know, putting practical applications to some of these theories. So it's kind of like introducing a concept and then the people who are applying it. Um, and we're going to do that through a mix of written content and video, and that should be launching in January. So a lot of work, and we're bringing on um, writers and copy editors who are contractors to help us out. But would love your support. If you read the content, click on the links so that we up our page views. Um, but most importantly, give us feedback. If you attend a talk or you hear one that you think is really fascinating or important, please reach out to me. Um, the next slide just shows you a sample of the layout, the design, like the kind of branding look and feel that we have uh, that translates across social media as well. Um, and the idea is to, this is part of a wider plan to establish thought leadership in this space so that when people think about um, Web3, blockchain, some of these important things that we're working on, that they think of protocol labs. So that's it for my project. And thank you so much for your time. Thanks again for everything. This was such an amazing experience for me. That's awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, looking forward to seeing that develop uh, even further over the next few months. Uh, Lucky's up next. Um, just a reminder, there's that QR code. Um, it, it'll appear throughout. Uh, so you'll have multiple opportunities to, um, to vote. Probably best to wait till the end, but uh, you can open it up and have it handy if you'd like. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, good to connect again. I'm back uh, to Canada and the cold is beginning to happen. Um, but uh, hopefully I will survive my first winter in Canada. Um, so as we have been discussing and as I've been like a governance champion across uh, 
Lisbon, um, we know that uh, the Filecoin Foundation is the governance steward for Filecoin ecosystem. Um, and at the moment, we don't have a publicly available roadmap uh, that shows our record of work and what Filecoin improvement proposals we have. Um, just as a background at the moment, most of the governance work is around Filecoin improvement proposals where members of the Filecoin ecosystem can propose technical or non-technical uh, proposals um, that can be included in, um, in, in the network upgrade that will happen, uh, uh, that, should, that should happen uh, within Filecoin. Um, at the moment, um, people are not sure how to engage uh, with the Filecoin improvement pro pro proposal process, um, and they're not sure where they can find what, uh, you know, the information as to what are the current FIPS, I'll call them FIPS to make it easier, uh, what current FIPS we have available, what do they talk about, um, how can I uh, be part of the governance process. Um, so. So what, what I'm doing at the moment is to identify um, and create a publicly available ledger that can show um, you know, what's, uh, what's available FIPS that we have, what the content is, who is championing the FIP and what stage is that FIP so that anyone can publicly uh, um, can over, you know, go in and check that information so that you also know a bit about the trajectory of the network and some of the work that our core developers are working on and what improvements we're going to be seeing uh, going forward. So um, what I've learned so far is that governance is a critical aspect of any open source protocol, including Filecoin, uh, but it becomes very, um, it's not very popular at the moment, which is great, uh, but uh, the conversations are happening. It shows that the, the network is maturing. Uh, because as the network matures, then it becomes very, uh, becomes like a political thing and people all have different opinions and ideas as to how the network can improve. Um, but a roadmap is useful. That way we can see what uh, improvements we are going to be uh, looking out for in the next uh, year uh, when we're hoping to see all these improvements or the proposals land uh, in the network upgrade and at what time um, and how you can engage and read more about what these um, uh, proposals are. Um, one of the things at the moment, um, one of the challenges that I had at the, you know, during Colo Week was identifying the best place to house this roadmap so that it's publicly available. So if there are colleagues in the team uh, who are good at, um, you know, uh, managing knowledge hubs or, or, or resources like this or tooling like this, please reach out to me um, so we can discuss how best to sort of publicize this roadmap. But at the moment, I am building that out. I have mapped out um, all the work across quarter four 2023, um, but it's still an internal document that I am not ready to share yet until um, maybe in two weeks time, but I can share a link where you can take a sneak peek as to what, uh, what improvement proposals we have at the moment. Next slide, please. Um, so, like I said, the, ro the roadmap would cover FIPS, the Filecoin Improvement Proposals. It will cover ecosystem development and engagement with members of the community. So, like I said, the FIPS should show us what are the publicly available, uh, what, what are the FIPS that are happening that anyone can read up about and understand, especially for technical colleagues or anyone who is just curious about what's uh, going on. Um, so, at the mo oops. Um, part of that work is also to cover governance work stream. So FIP is not the only uh, work stream that the governance team at the Falcon Foundation, what we're doing. We also have um, events and activities we're hoping to launch to publicize governance and to make governance popular amongst uh, the ecosystem. Um, so that's also one of the things you find in that um, roadmap. You can go to the next slide. So progress so far, like I said, I have drafted the first um, the first uh, roadmap. I will share a link where you can have a sneak peek, but it's not publicly available yet. Um, and then you would see some of the Firepoint improvement proposals that will go into the next Shark network upgrade, which is good, as well as some other Firepoint improvement proposals that are being drafted and worked on by several technical colleagues at the moment. So you can just read up and know what they are all about. And hopefully they can go into the next uh, network upgrade next year. Um, so 
Um, next steps, again, I did find the platform so we can house this roadmap so that it's easily accessible by everyone, uh, regardless of technical background or proficiency. Um, yes, uh, and I think that's that's it from my side. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lucky. Um, yeah, exciting to see where that one goes as well. Um, and uh, Lucky gave a an uncomp session in um, in Lisbon, which was cool. We got to learn a little bit more about um, the work of governance. Um, Allison's up next with Network Goods. Good morning, afternoon, evening, middle of the night. I can't believe the time zones that we have here. It was so nice to be in Lisbon at the same time. Um, so I am the people ops lead for Network Goods. Um, and for those who made it through everything, which I believe you have because you're here, um, you'll note that in the Launchpad curriculum, there was a single um, presentation by Matt, our head of uh, network funding, in order to talk about network goods as an organization and specifically network funding. Um, and I wasn't satisfied with that. So I'm putting together a uh, curriculum element for my team, which was really created, and you can move to the next slide. Um, as some background, um, it was really created as the evolution of the PL research team, which no longer exists in the same entity. Um, and it really became this combination of research moving more towards meta research, as well as funding for the public goods. And our mission is to engineer tools and opportunities for revolutionary coordination systems. Um, not a lot of people know about us here at PL and the PLN, and we really want to up our PR within the network, um, public relations for those who don't know the um, shorthand for that. And so I'm putting together and have started this learning journey, um, which I can give you um, the objectives on the next page, I believe. So um, these still need to be refined. I will probably talk to some of our expert um, learning and development leads and everyone who works at Launchpad um, here. But right now, the plan is to have seven learning objectives moving from understanding of just what network goods are and public goods and how they're similar but slightly different um, and how research and funding work together. And then being able to conceptualize and understand all of the different parts of our organization, which includes network funding um, that you've all learned about, but also network research and research acceleration, which are other areas um, spanning a whole bunch of projects that we do on the network goods team. Um, Ideally, there would be a high level understanding of some of our main projects. If anyone was able to attend Funding the Commons in Lisbon, you heard a lot about hypercerts, for example. Um, and so uh, I'm not going to read through each of these. I think um, you can do that async. Um, but that's really kind of the overall. Uh, yes, everyone has a different definition of PR. That's why <laughs> pull requests. I clearly am not an engineer. But thank you, Marco, for, for sharing that with me. I'll be more careful with my acronyms. Um, moving to the next slide, I can talk about the roadmap itself. So I'm still at the very, very beginning of this, and that's really around planning and content discovery. Um, as I'm here, I joined the company about six weeks ago myself. So learning all this stuff is new to me, as well as trying to build out a learning curriculum um, to explain it to others. So right now I'm in the this um, the stage of collecting artifacts, transcribing, watching all the videos, um, and really trying to get my head around the content itself. Um, ideally, looking at Q1 next year, I'll be able to put together a skeleton framework for the curriculum itself um, and start to pilot it with those who are experts in what we do, i.e. the Network Goods team. Um, following quarter, the plan is to iterate and finalize that and then pilot it with uh, folks outside of network goods to make sure that it is accessible for anyone, regardless of their familiarity with the content going in. And then hopefully by May, um, I'm hoping that we would be able to go live on Launchpad itself and really make this part of the curriculum that everyone going through this program will be able to participate in. Um, and then kind of from that, 
moving into this really being adapted and expanded further for our network goods, new team members were hoping to onboard a whole bunch in 2023. Um, but also really to increase the awareness, not just within the PLN, but also um, external to PL, to our network of researchers and funders and everyone that we're trying to create this movement around for funding the public goods um, through our work, such as funding the commons, um, which I encourage you all to watch videos for if you weren't able to attend. Um, so on the next slide, I believe I go into the stage that I'm in. So um, I covered that already. And I think some of the challenges really, as I mentioned, I'm new myself. So this is all new material for me to learn and understand and then be able to educate around. Um, and also lab week and prepping for lab week, definitely put a pin in my ability to um, progress in this project. Uh, so there is a new focus on it now that we're back, um, or now that I'm back rather. And that's kind of the plan going forward. Great, thanks, Allison. Uh, yeah, Lab Week, Lab Week threw uh, threw a curveball into a lot of uh, these projects, which is all the more impressive that um, when we see all all the work that you um, you all have created um, and are sharing with us today. So, um, extra big props to to all of you for for uh, coming up with these cool ideas and and seeing them closer to fruition, if not all the way, um, while managing Cola Week and Lab Week, etc. Daniel's up next. Uh, I think I saw him on here. Okay, hey, great. So thank you very much, guys. Uh, well, as everyone knows, I'm an unmatched candidate. So I don't have a specific team that I was working on regarding my project, though I do have interests. And my interests are uh, basically related to um, uh, this I will go later on. But well, my interests were basically related to crypto econ and to cryptography. Uh, the talk, those were the two talks that I will uh, say that impact me the most from the Lisbon uh, part of the curriculum. The talk from uh, Vic and the talk, especially the talk from Professor Rosario Gennaro. So at the end, uh, in my project, and something weird is happening there in the screen. Um, yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, my project is related to these two fields in the following way. Uh, I want to introduce you to Lendy. Lendy, it's a platform to allow Filecoin storage providers to borrow Filecoins against the future rewards of their Filecoin storage deals. So the reason this might be needed, and this is something that came from my conversation with CryptoEcon, is that the storage providers need working capital, but they might not have uh, themselves uh, a lot of assets to actually back a loan but they already have committed uh, some resources to buy their hardware and also some uh, collateral to basically secure their Falcon deals. But then what is the equity that they have uh, is their Falcon deals, right? But those are future rewards that they will receive. It's not assets that they already own. It's not Falcon that they already own, but it's Falcon that they will own in the future. So the idea of Lendy is to allow these uh, uh, Filecoin future uh, income to become a collateral for loans. So how it works is that the storage provider has to register into the platform. And this, it works by providing to Lendy their uh, storage provider ID and the BSL uh, key that actually uh, ensures that they own that storage provider ID. So that's a cryptographic signature. Then, and the uh, the Ethereum address is kind of linked to that uh, um, to that specific uh, storage provider ID, and then the Lendy platform has access to see all the specific uh, Filecoin deals that that specific storage provider has. The other uh, the other part of this is uh, when they are there, then they can lock those uh, uh, Filecoin storage deals. And when they lock one deal, what happens is that the future rewards of that deal cannot be used to do it for any other purpose than for paying the loans that they have taken in the platform. So that's the way that they lock the collateral basically, but it's uh, obviously that collateral would not appear until the storage deal expires and they get the rewards. 
So basically that's it. You log your deals and then that will provide you collateral and then you can borrow a certain percentage of the value of that collateral. Obviously everything in Filecoin. Uh, I put here like 80%, but that's kind of like not, uh, not uh, written in stone. And that's the way it works. So basically what it's assuming is that there is an Oracle service that will allow uh, to link their Ethereum address to a storage provider ID and also assumes that that Oracle can work with if within the Falcon ecosystem to be able to uh, get all the storage deals that they have and lock the capital. Now I want to get the screen to go, go to the proper demo. If I could, maybe. Yeah, I'll stop sharing and you should be able to share. Great. So let's go here. It's difficult to see. It's here. No, it's here. Let me share. So can you see my screen? Yes, we can. So basically here it is. Of course, right now it's user not detected because I have not linked my MetaMask. So I will sign on into Lendy right now. <laughs> Since I already linked my account, it's going to work. But the Oracle doesn't really work inside Filecoin. This is everything working in uh, Polygon and I'm just mocking the Oracle. So it's not actually touching any Filecoin uh, testnet uh, state, but basically this is the idea. So I will link this account, connect, and I'm getting my data. So here it is that this is a provider ID address in Filecoin ecosystem. And I already have linked it, so this uh, button is uh, disabled, but if I was not linked, I could have clicked this and provide my uh, VSL key and actually my provider ID, and then the Oracle is supposedly to be verifying that I control that through the VSL signature. Then here I can see my, uh, my actual uh, storage deals. So here I actually have lock, these paper deals, uh, only one of them, which is this for 633 file coin with this uh, deal ID. And I can use uh, these, I can borrow against this uh, future reward here. So uh, here is assuming that I lent already 100 file coin against that. I could go to lock other storage IDs and that will kind of like storage deals. And that will allow me to borrow even more, but I will not be able to touch these funds until I pay those debts. So basically that's the way it's supposed to work. Uh, I will return to the presentation to just go to the assumptions part. <coughs> and choo -choo. Okay, the next one. Next, ah, okay, this one, uh, yeah, the previous one, previous one. So the actual stack for the application is Solidity and Foundry for the smart contract side and React is the front end. The code you can find here in this, uh, in this repo and uh, then you can download and play with it. Uh, the front end is complete, but it has to be integrated fully with the smart contract, which is not done yet. Even with the mock part, which is uh, not actually dealing with the Falcon. So next one. And this is the way to go. it deals with my interests, right? Obviously the lending platform is a very uh, important topic of research for CryptoEcon. That's something that they want to research as well. And actually the process to make this Oracle work, right? Uh, be able to get the Falcon state and not only get it, but maybe modify it through uh, smart contracts is one of the projects that CryptoNet is actually working on. So there are a lot of synergies with those teams, uh, both with the protocol level part, which is kind of building how the data is gonna be presented with the storage primitives through work with those storage primitives in other world blockchains. And also with the Medusa team, which is building kind of like the compute side of having zero knowledge way of sharing that data. So it's kind of like uh, serendipitous that at the end, I ended up working in a project that is very related to the most, um, uh, to the teams that I want to work within uh, PL. So that's basically in, uh, right now is uh, everything mock, but you can play with it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Super exciting. Uh, and uh, thanks for uh, sharing that demo. I think we have a few more demos coming up shortly. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I also have um, a demo for everyone. So, 
Okay, so in my launchpad project, I was actually working on something that I'm uh, so that's related to my to, to what what my team is doing. And uh, if you if you remember that, so we want to have a measurement campaign on the decentralized net hole punching. And in this launchpad project, I was just trying to ease the onboarding of uh, participants of this measurement campaign. And oops. Okay, hang on. This this shouldn't work. Here we go. And uh, yeah, for for that, I built this little uh, menu bar tool, uh, which you can see here at the at the bottom. And uh, yeah, just as I said, to reduce onboarding friction. And then there are some some details around how we do API key requirements around that, and so on. So let's give a, a brief uh, context again. So in a peer-to-peer -peer network, um, it's actually very important to have full connectivity among all peers in the network. But the internet as it's built right now is actually tailored towards this client-server model. So you're, you're not easily able to just connect to your neighbor or to uh, another person in the same room. Um, this is just uh, how the internet is built right now. And uh, the, the people of the LP2P team built this um, specific no hole punching protocol, which allows up to a certain percentage um, yeah, for just peers to connect, despite all these nets and firewalls and so on. And in this measurement campaign, I just I actually want to measure the success rate of this protocol and how well it works. And for that, we need as many people as possible to run this client, which will just do a hole punch to a random other peer and then report back if it worked or not. And for that, um, yeah, I, I developed this little menu bar item, uh, menu bar application, which is actually pretty easy to install. And I want to showcase that uh, in this in this short demo here. Um, so if you head to the um, repository page here, which I will just drop into the uh, into the chat later on, you can scroll down. And I think if I remember correctly from our Launchpad Coder Week, most of you are on, on a Mac. So you can just decide if, so if you're on a newer Mac, you, you could download the M1, M2 version. And if on an older Mac, the Intel version. So I'm on the newer one, so I would just download um, the application here. So it got downloaded here to the left. And then I can just double click it, install it to my applications folder, and then start it up. Click open. And now, now it's asking me for an API key. So if you want to have um, a, a customized analysis of the data that you are contributing contributing to the research project, you could request a, uh, a personal API key here, but uh, this is not necessary. So you could just press continue. And then it's asking you if you want to have it launch on startup. I click yes in my case. And then you can see this little icon here on the top right, and it's already started. So now it's just sitting there and running and doing all the hole punching stuff in the background. And it's taking very little resources. I think it's just around 2% of CPU and 100 megabytes of memory and not much bandwidth at all. So like a lightweight website every few minutes uh, worth of bandwidth maybe. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. And so, so you shouldn't actually notice that it's sitting there. And well, I refined some of our dashboards which show just how everything works. Um, the, the, these are some technical details here or some uh, performance measurements. So if, a few minutes ago, it was just seven. So this is the active clients in the network right now. So there are just eight clients running at the moment. And just before I started this, uh, my, my own client, it was at seven. So I'm the eighth one now. So it's working. And uh, yeah, I would highly uh, appreciate if many of you would just download uh, this little client application and leave it running. Our plan is, so you don't need to do it now, but our plan is to have as many people as possible signed up or well, at least down um, having downloaded this application until December so that the um, that we can, can have as many people as possible to have this client running throughout December so that we gather a lot of data and that we can do a an analysis on that, and also we want this is also a research project. We want to write it in a scientific publication uh, from from that data, and uh, yeah. So I will drop some some links after my uh, after this demo here, and uh, I hope you can sign up and uh, yeah participate. Well, yeah, I think that's it already from my from my demo here. Thanks, Daniel.
Um, I think you might have 27 new signups, maybe 26 new signups after that. Uh, so uh, nice plug there and uh, please share. And uh, I see the chat, there's a request for um, for sharing of, of, of all previous um, resources uh, mentioned. So um, let's continue to do that uh, as we go through. Spice AI guys, take it away. Yeah, all right, sweet. Uh, so um, what uh, we did for our project was, um, looking at how we can use some of the uh, Web3 ecosystem um, to kind of help some of the processing that uh, we are using um, to gather information, you know, for some of our client base. So uh, we looked at uh, building on Bacalao to kind of improve um, the data that we're getting from Web3. So move on to the next slide and then I'll just give you a little highlight here. Uh, so a little about Spice here. We're an early stage startup. Uh, we're also a Proto Call Labs portfolio company. Um, and one of the reasons we chose to work with Bacalao is because we are a part of the Compute Over Data working group. So trying to help keep that moving forward. Um, we presented during uh, uh, working group number six for the Compute Over Data. Um, and then we, we just launched in April of this year. So we're still kind of early stage and uh, building out. All right, next slide, please. And so basically what we were looking at here is, um, you know, one of the problems with data is the egress of data is very expensive. And so we're trying to look at solving that a bit by uh, trying to use that decentralized compute um, to run those compute jobs closest to where the data is. And so for our project, um, what we did is we used uh, Spice to get a collection of the Board Ape Yacht Club and then um, get the owner of it, one of the specific uh, board apes and look at the number of NFTs that that specific owner had within their collection and then taking that collection from that owner and just turning them into a collage. Not a super fancy thing, but it's just an example of kind of taking a bunch of data and then using that processing power of Bacalao um, to turning it into something uh, interesting, I guess. And so the, the demo here will be about six minutes. So feel free to play it at like one and a quarter speed or something to kind of speed it up a little bit, Dave. But if you just go to the next slide, you can go ahead and click play there. And this is Philip presenting at the Compute Over Data Summit. For this demo, I'm going to um, take the Board 8 Yacht Club uh, NFT collection. So this is the address here that I- You can I go to full size there. Yeah. Audio is perfect. And, um, and just, I'll run this query in just a few seconds. I'll be able to get all 10,000 of the board eight NFTs, and I can find the current owners of all of those ten thousands in just a few seconds using Spice. And so, let's say that uh, you know I'm really interested in this one five three zero six, and so I want to find all of the NFTs that the current owner of this NFT has in their collection and make a collage from that. So the way I would do that in Spice is, I would say, okay, well I'm only interested in token ID five three zero six. Run that query. We would get back the owner information. Um, yeah, so we got this back. And so we can take the current owner of the NFT, and then I can basically, with the same data set, um, our NFT owner's data set, I can query, okay, what are all the NFTs that this current owner possesses? And so I'll run that query in Spice. It'll take a few seconds, and then I'll get back. There should be around 17 um, that I found from earlier. And uh, normally what we would do is uh, once once you uh, use this interface to kind of explore the data that you're interested in, we have here a data set reference here of all the different data sets for the chains that we support. Um, and then once you're kind of interested in, you find the query that you're interested in, you would put this into your application using our SDKs or, um, and that's how you would integrate Spice into your uh, application. Uh, but for the purposes of this demo, I'm just going to download this using CSV. And so we'll be able to show you that uh, data here directly. The, the, the way that this demo is going to work is, uh, so you showed, I just showed using Spice to get the NFTs that are owned by a wallet, um, but I need to next call the, the token URI. And so in Ethereum, there is, uh, a token URI function on the smart contract. So like if I call that function with the token ID that I'm interested in, I will get back this IPFS link that I need to then um, pull off. And so if I actually show you what's in this IPFS, uh, so I'll just resolve this. So this is the content ID of that uh, link from the token URI. Um, and if I actually show you what is in here, it's just a JSON uh, file. So I mentioned before that, you know, data is moving off chain. So this is a, kind of one example where the image link is not actually stored on chain. It's a metadata file that points to the image link. So we actually need to do two things. We need to first run a job in Bakley how that parses that metadata out from all of these different 
uh, metadata JSON files. And then once we have the actual IPFS links that have the, the image data, we can run a second job that will go and create our collage for us. And so we can see here the token address here is on the left first column, and then the token ID is the second one. And so what I'll do here to run the Backley Hall job is I have a little helpful script that will um, get the metadata URIs by calling the Ethereum smart contract. So, you know, this is going and calling the Ethereum smart contract. Um, we filter out the ones that are not, IPF, not IPFS right now. Um, and we'll just work with the ones that are in IPFS. And then you see here that some of these are um, files within a folder that's stored in IPFS. So we actually need to go and resolve all of the content IDs of this. So I'll do that now. Um, so this is actually resolving the, the content IDs of these into the, the actual IPFS content ID, and then dumping the what I need to pass into Backley How into these volume arguments. These are the, the commands that we actually need to mount the, this data into Backley How so that the job can access it. And then I'll come into Docker run. And then I'll run this first job that will actually parse out the metadata. So in this parse metadata script, all we're doing is just scanning all the files that are in this directory and then extracting out that image URI that I showed uh, here. So we're extracting out this image URI for all of the, the images. And it's writing it to this file called image URIs pickle. Cool. And so now I have this job uh, completed so I can take out these image URIs. And then I can move on to the next step. So now I've got all the, the links to IPFS for all the images that I'm going to create the collage out of. Now I'm actually going to run a Backley Hall job that will um, assemble these into a collage. But I'll go ahead and run that now. Uh, generate volume args. And we're going to use image URIs pickle. So we have similar to what before, we have these commands that will actually allow us to uh, attach this to the Buckley Hell job. So I'll run another Buckley Hell job here and then pass in the command that actually will create the collage. It's cool. And so the way that this uh, script is running is uh, very similar to the first one. It's going to loop through all of the um, images that are, have been mounted into that directory. It will format them into kind of the same size and then output this collage called collage.jpg. And so now we have here. A collage of all of the NFTs from the data that we got in Spice. <laughs> One of our goals at Spice is to um, kind of integrate the Backley Hell experience directly into our into the product. And so the uh, where you might have something that looks more like this, where all of the stuff that I just showed you is kind of contained within Spice, and all you would need to do is just upload some NFT processing job that needs to combine both on-chain and off-chain data, and then we would handle the scheduling and running of it for you. All right. So yeah, again, that was uh, Philip presenting at the Computer Data Summit. Um, you know that the full recording that was a chopped up version. Uh, you know, for time constraints here. So uh, you know, feel free to jump on there if you want to kind of get the uh, more in depth version of that. But basically, yeah, like you mentioned, we're looking at trying to uh, integrate Bacala into our system. That way, we can kind of uh, more easily. Um, make the experience for customers kind of trying to query IPFS data and uh, Web3 data to kind of just have it one integrated experience um, and using Bacalao there uh, to run those compute jobs um, next to where the data is stored. So uh, just here's some places you can be able to find us. Uh, you can click on the links there on the slide once those are made available. And um, that's it. Any questions? Thanks, Derek. Anjuman's up next. He wasn't able to make it to the presentation day, so we've got a um, recording. And let's take a look at this uh, this presentation here. Hi, uh, I'm Anjuman, and I'm on the Collabs team in the Autocore ecosystem working group. This presentation is a thought experiment on how the IPFS stack can be used to make satellite sensor transmissions more reliable. So just a level set, satellites can be in three possible orbits, low, medium, and geosynchronous. And you can see from the diagram down below that those are three very different altitudes above Earth. Most famous satellites that we know about, Starlink Constellation, Hubble, International Space Station, and other defense satellites are in lower Earth orbit, anywhere between zero and 2,000 kilometers above ground. Uh, this is very different from geosynchronous satellites, which are about 38,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. So low Earth uh, orbit satellites have certain advantages and disadvantages. Some of the advantages are it's very low latency. It's closer to Earth, so a round trip, uh, you know, ping will probably be around 20 to 40 milliseconds. Uh, it costs less to put them there in the first place, and they're extremely fast. So they go over um, an entire orbit in anywhere between 90 to 120 minutes. And because they're closer to Earth, the sensors on board can acquire much, a much higher resolution of data from the Earth's surface. Some of the disadvantages are to do with the fact that they are so fast. Um, since it's closer to ground, um, it, when it zooms by a ground terminal at high speed, uh, there might not be enough time for it to transmit the relevant data uh, 
to grant that, that has been requested. Um, and the other is there is plenty of credible evidence that these satellites can be disrupted by nation state actors, Russia, China, India, they've all demonstrated uh, deorbiting satellites via missile launches. And this slide uh, just shows how short an ideal flyby can actually last uh, based on just the geometry of the Earth. So the diagram on the left is a cross section of the sky looking up from a ground station. And you can see when a satellite goes nearly directly on top of us, uh, it can be as short as 15 minutes. And in a far less ideal scenario where it's off over the horizon, it could take as little as eight minutes. And that's assuming we can even see it over a mountain or a building or something like that. And so let's do some really uh, rough math to estimate you know, how, how much imagery or sensor data we can actually transmit in a 10 minute flyby. And so if we look at uh, some of the bands these lower Earth orbit satellites use, uh, we can roughly estimate around a GB of transmission for a 10 minute flyby. Uh, and if we look at the data that the satellite's actually acquiring, you know, five by five kilometer image with 16 bit color and half meter resolution, which by no means is the best, um, is about 0.2 gigs. And what that means is in a 10 minute flyby, we can transmit five of these images. That's not ideal. Some of these satellites collect data over seven different wavelength spectrums. Um, and there's definitely going to be collects that are larger than uh, 25 square kilometers. And so a lot of companies are using satellite interconnects over a constellation to actually get longer coverage, even when the collected satellite is not in view. And so Starlink, military satellites, they're doing this by the radio or laser uh, connections. And so kind of a spoiler alert, um, once you start squinting at what an interconnected satellite constellation looks like, it starts looking a lot like an IPFS swarm. And so getting to the punchline, um, we can actually use different um, components of the IPFS stack uh, in a way that, that, that makes transmission more reliable and allows all of these units, the ground stations, the satellites, to speak the same language. And so, for example, for IPLD, we could have a custom geolocation-based IPLD spec that actually chunks the overall imagery into smaller grid sizes. Um, these then could also be serialized into car files if they want to be chunked together. For example, I might want to see, you know, a shipyard with the water that's nearby because it is extremely relevant to see what ships have been launched. Um, lib P2P is a great protocol because I am talking over radio, I'm talking over optical laser, I am talking over fiber optic backhaul on the ground, um, and I'm talking between all these peers. And so lib P2P is a great solution for maintaining those connections. IPFS allows us to broadcast relevant CIDs down to the ground. And then we can have the ground station keep pulling the swarm overhead uh, for relevant blocks and, and CIDs. And the cool thing is if these blocks are constructed smartly, even before I've received the entire Merkle DAG, I can kick off data processing for blocks I have received, especially which is especially important for low latency cases in defense. Uh, for example, Brazil is trying to use satellite imagery to figure out where there are fires and send teams within two hours to go you know, fight them. Like you don't have time to acquire the entire imagery on a three different team pipeline. Um, and then send them. And then finally, because the orbit times are so low, um, there's a lot of collects over the same area, but across time. And so IPNS is actually a great solution for versioning those across spectral wavelengths and across time. And so what that means is if I only have, I'm a ground station and I only have the bandwidth to receive one image, IPNS could be an easy way for a certain tasking to receive just the latest one and archive the old ones. And finally, um, here's a graphical view of uh, how IPFS, oh, yeah, here's a graphical view of how IPFS can be used by ground station uh, to kick off ground processing uh, you know, while the satellite is connected to the ground station, continue processing while the satellite is disconnected, but the ground station can still request blocks from the swarm. And finally, when the satellite reconnects with another ground station, now my original one can actually peer over the very high bandwidth um, backhaul on the ground. And so um, this is just a quick foray into how IPFS can be used uh, in a satellite constellation. I'll probably be sharing some of these thoughts with the browsers and platforms team and excited to see if we can integrate these approaches into our partnership with Lucky. Thank you. Cool. That one was a little different. Satellites. Awesome. Uh, can we move forward? There we go. Um, yeah, wow. <laughs> This presentation is out of this world. I like that, James. Um, very cool. Uh, and yeah, just again, the QR codes there as we go through. Um, Jonathan's up next. This one, uh, for anybody who's at the Angres dinner, um, this one got a lot of applause. Uh, 
I, if this is the one, maybe not. Maybe maybe uh, I'll let Jonathan jump in here and uh, and and uh, explain more. Yeah, it's kind of similar. At the end, you'll see they're they're two separate ones. You'll see at the end that they're coming together, sort of in the works. Um, cool. So, hi everyone. I'm Jonathan. Um, I'll be talking about uh, a demo application I made called Only Files, and Only Files is um, using a protocol called Medusa, which I'm working on under the CryptoNet team. Great. So from a very high level, um, we could start with just a set of problems and a set of solutions. So this uh, first problem is a, a personal problem. I guess it's a goal of mine, which is that I needed to build an application um, to showcase Medusa. So Medusa is a protocol that's sort of geared towards uh, developers. Developers would be the users of Medusa who would then go build sort of applications for, for end users. So for me, it's important to, um, I guess, uh, sort of use use my dog food, sort of my own stuff so I can better understand the developer experience um, and build better tooling um, for future developers to, to sort of build on, on Medusa. So the solution here is this, this demo application, Only Files, and Only Files allows you to sell access to content using decentralized protocols rather than centralized platforms. Um, so, you, you know, sim the decentralized version of OnlyFans, let's say. Um, and, and it's it's pretty well relevant because sometimes, you know, we might ask ourselves, why are we doing all this work uh, to build these decentralized protocols? And, you know, they can be kind of expensive. The user experience can be not great. So sometimes it doesn't make as much sense. But I think for this problem, it makes a lot of sense because even just in the last year, we've seen a lot of, you know, deep platforming, um, of, of various people on different social media platforms, but especially on, on OnlyFans and uh, sort of with sex workers in particular. So, uh, and how they sort of get deplatformed or censored um, is through, I guess, a few means. And so primarily you have uh, payments in Web2, which are, you know, which are sort of run by a handful of big players like Visa and MasterCard and PayPal. And more or less those payment processors sort of have arbitrary control to, to block payments and generally censor financial transactions. But of course, in Web3, we have a solution for that. Um, blockchains, sort of, that was sort of the initial start of Bitcoin, which sort of enabled a peer-to-peer -peer payments network. Um, so, so we have a solution there. We have a piece of the solution. Um, now going back to the problems, we also have issues with, with storage and access. So you know, for a lot of these user-generated content platforms, um, there's a company that runs that platform, builds the platform. You upload the content to them, but essentially after you upload it, it's really not fully yours anymore. I mean, they have, they store it, proprietary databases, and probably the terms of service say that they can do whatever they want with it. Um, and that's obviously can be problematic. Um, in Web3, we have Filecoin, which is an amazing sort of open storage network where anyone can upload files and anyone can provide storage for files, as long as sort of the deals and, and uh, the sort of crypto economic conditions are met. Um, and then similar to related to storage is we have access control. Who can, who can access those files, right? And so in web two, um, there's a policy for who can buy and sell content or who can upload and view content, but it's, and they may sort of tell you what it is, uh, maybe in the terms of service or, or other places, but you can't view the code that controls that. You can't really verify it. Um, and moreover, like I mentioned earlier, there's sort of a policy for who can do what, but ultimately the company is sort of has the ultimate kind of control over that. And they, if they want to view the data and do what they want with it, they can do that. Um, and so now this is sort of where Medusa comes into, into the mix, which is uh, that Medusa is a decentralized access control um, network, right? So basically anyone can um, create rules for who can sort of view their content and they can have a guarantee that no one else is going to see that content um, assuming that the network is operating properly in, in the right sort of crypto economic conditions, secure that network. Great. So, and I'll just go over the design of Medusa just very, very briefly. Um, this is kind of like the, the general architecture of how the system works. So on the left, you have uh, client applications. So only files is an example. Um, you could also have, you know, private mailing list for nft holders or document sharing and so basically each one of these applications um there's some content that you want to control access to um and you want to put those rules on chain or somewhere that's sort of transparent um and so with only files the rules are like you know i upload content instead of price and if you pay for it then you get to see it 
for the mailing list, it's like if you own an NFT, you can sort of see the posts on the mailing lists. And with document sharing, you could think like like a decentralized Google Drive, um, where you know maybe I can submit a proof that I have a at protocol dot AI email address, and that lets me see all the documents in you know within the company, the organization. Um, and then in the middle, you have this Medusa contract, which can live on many different blockchains. Um, and essentially, the, the contract controls you know, where you can send requests and receive results back from the Medusa network. Um, and then on the right, you have the network, which essentially uh, you have many different nodes that are sort of running this network. And basically what they do is they all have shares of, of a private key. And if a, if a valid request comes in, you sort of need a majority or a threshold of those nodes to, to kind of compute a, a partial result. So a partial like decryption, for example, they can aggregate those together and send the result back on chain. Um, but of course that result, though it is public, anyone can see the result, only the individual that it's intended for can actually use the result, can actually use um, the result to go and, and view some data. Great, so, and only files, I kind of mentioned a lot of this already, but right, the idea is you have secret content, you upload it, you set a price, whoever pays that price can see it. Um, and sort of the, the tools that, that we're using are Filecoin to store these encrypted, this encrypted content, a blockchain, some blockchain. Um, for this demo, I'm, I'm using the Arbitrum testnet, but could be anyone. Um, and you know, on that blockchain, you deploy a smart contract, which sort of sets the rules for who can access your data. Um, and if, you, if payment is a part of that, you can also use the blockchain for that. Um, and then we have Medusa, which is sort of controlling the re-encryption or, or the unlocking of content um, based on payment being received. Okay, so now I'll go into the demo, which I tried to show before and it didn't work, but it should work this time, fingers crossed. So, okay, here we are. And actually, let me, if anyone wants to play with this as well, I'll just sort of pop it in the chat. Maybe I'll do it after. Yeah, here it is. So you can go go use it there. Um, first thing I'll mention is there is a there's a faucet here, so I, it's kind of difficult to get like testnet ETH on Arbitrum, but I've set up a faucet. Please don't abuse it. <laughs> if there's not really any rate li rate limiting on it, um, but basically, if you connect your wallet, you can click the faucet. It'll send you like 0 0.01 testnet ETH, and that, that should be enough to kind of use the application. So let me just, I'm gonna refresh the page. So now I'm sort of not logged in, not connected. I can connect my wallet. Great, I can sign in. And so what happens when you sign in is you essentially, you sign a message and then we can use that signature to basically derive your, your key or your sort of like Medusa identity. Um, and so this is nice because it means that we don't store any keys anywhere. You don't have to store any keys as long as you have your sort of Ethereum private key um, you can use that to kind of use Medusa. So, so here we have a form and this is all very rough sort of looking, but basically you have a form to upload your content. You know, I have some unlocked content already here. Um, and then down below you can these like listings, uh, where you can, you can pay and sort of unlock content. So let's, you know, upload something. I have some, okay. This like stable diffusion kind of iguana looking thing. Um, let's say I just, I want to sell that. So I'll put in a price and we'll make it pretty cheap. Maybe a little more zero there. And then let's see, this is like full iguana from stable diffusion AI thingy. And then I'll click to sell my secret. And so now it'll take a second, but it's, uh, encrypted it. It's uploaded to IPFS. And now it's asking me to sign a transaction. Um, to register that content with Medusa. So now it's registered. I should be able to scroll down and see it for sale down here. Okay, great. Here's my cool iguana. Um, you know, you can see it on IPFS, but you're just gonna see sort of an encrypted blob or really you're not gonna see anything because it's trying to render an image. Um, but I can click unlock it. I'll pay the fee with a little bit of gas. And then it should show up here. It's kind of decrypting it at the moment. Should have a better animation there to, to kind of give a better idea, but give it a second and, and there it is. So 
Um, you please play with the demo, break it. Uh, you know, and this is sort of a rough, really proof, proof of concept, but we'll see where this could be heading in the future. Um, so, so I think the future uh, is this the only fans project uh, that was kind of presented at the Andres dinner in Lisbon. But um, I think, I guess the, how these two things come together is that this this problem of, of uh, providing like a, a decentralized platform for people to basically buy and sell content it's much bigger than just the access control and the storage um, because there's there's other sort of more difficult problems or more kind of social or human problems to solve as well um things like content discovery you know like like which would include maybe like a reputation system and sort of being able to follow people being able to search for content and having content suggested to you but how do you do that in a decentralized way so it's kind of an interesting interesting problem um privacy is another issue where medusa will uh allows you to sort of control access to private content but you can still see transaction metadata when you use medusa so someone could still see that I paid for content from someone else. They won't know what it is that I got, but they could still see that that transaction happened. So that's probably something, especially in this context, that we would want to improve or figure out a solution for. Um, content moderation, like things like, uh, I guess, like banned content, um, which is difficult because there's some things that are quite obviously, you know, should be sort of banned from a platform, but there's also kind of a gray area. And so um, coming up with a good way to sort of reach, have like social consensus about what should be sort of moderated and what shouldn't be is, is also a very difficult problem. Um, and then, yeah, like abuse avoidance, you know, how do we sort of avoid things like hate speech um, and also things like content theft, um, where, you know, maybe someone takes someone else's content and sort of uploads it as their own. And that's obviously a problem, but there, it's kind of an interesting research question. Like maybe there are ways to do sort of cryptographic water watermarking um, on content. So that's interesting, but again, very difficult problem. So this is kind of where the, the OnlyFans collaboration comes in. Um, the OnlyFans is sort of a project that's that's uh, kind of being researched in the consensus lab. And so we, we sort of realized like, okay, obviously we need some sort of access control. Medusa is perfect for that. So that's really sort of the evolution of this demo is um, the next steps to basically integrate Medusa with the sort of the OnlyFans uh, subnet on Filecoin and then continue to build out uh, the proof of concept and sort of see, see where it goes from there. But um, that's, that's all I've got. Thank you all for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, Slack me or, uh, and we can set up a call. Um, and, and so, yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. Very cool stuff. Um, yeah, these, these are really impressive. Uh, we've got James up next. All right, hey everybody, uh, James here. If you recall, I'm a technical writer, so surprise, my stuff relates to technical writing and the IPFS docs specifically, which is the doc set that I'm going to be starting on here at Protocol Labs. Um, so uh, if you could move to the next slide, please. Um, so the overall idea here was to do a couple mini projects that were more or less related to the IPFS docs and technical writing in general, as well as uh, the a larger initiative on the team I'm on, which is Docs as a Service uh, for the larger Protocol Labs network. Um, so what did I do? I created um, the, I, how do you say, recreated uh, the IPFS Docs on a Hugo Static website as opposed to ViewPress, which is what we currently use. Uh, it's really just a wireframe, not meant to actually be a, a functional uh, documentation set. Um, created a tutorial uh, template to be used for uh, quick tutorial creation, um, and it played around with some CI/CD tools that are specific to technical writing, like Veil uh, and Markdown Lint. Uh, I didn't get to integrating source code like I wanted to, but it's still something I'm interested in. Um, all right, so why did I do this? Uh, one big thing that was uh, really helpful about Lisbon was uh, IPFS camp. Uh, at IPFS camp, I was walking around just talking to folks, uh, developers, you know, real real people, I guess, building on IPFS. Um, I sat in the community circle that was led by uh, Reed from the Kubo team, uh, got a lot of great feedback there, um, basically dumped all of that into a Notion doc, which folks can look at if they're interested in. Um, and yeah, it's just a bunch of feedback about the IPFS docs experience. Um, you know, my experience in Launchpad was really helpful too, for just kind of thinking about, you know, how do we, um, how, what's the best way to organize content in IPFS? I wanted to test Hugo. Um, 
because it has some other features that VPress doesn't. Um, and I'm always a big fan of automation. There's certain things in technical writing that just kind of are not fun to do, like, you know, combing a markdown document for spelling errors, definitely not my favorite thing. Um, and this all relates back to docs as a service. So we'll move on to the different parts of this. Uh, Dave, if you could, next slide, please. All right, so the first thing I did here was uh, set up an IPFS docs wireframe on Hugo. Uh, I want to give a big shout out to my colleague Johnny, who's not here. Um, for those of you who were in Lisbon, Johnny gave the IPFS desktop walkthrough. Um, and while Johnny was in Lisbon, he started working on a uh, GitHub repo to quickly spin up a Hugo uh, doc site template, essentially, uh, for the docs as a service initiative. You can check it out, um, you know, whenever you like. We'd love feedback. Um, so I served as a guinea pig for that. It's really great. I uh, was able to spin up a website in about 10 minutes. Uh, has a lot of stuff already templatized, uh, pretty easy to use. Uh, has a lot of great features baked in there. Um, some things that are specific to Hugo, relative references as opposed to manual links. Um, basically, Hugo won't build um, if the rel refs aren't working, whereas Vpress will build with broken links. Um, so that's a quality issue has nice themes. Um, menus are automatically created for every single page based on the header depth. Um, there's things like short codes, so you can create like tabbed views, which I'm a, a big fan of. Um, and then Johnny started working on commands to automatically create top bars, sidebars, and page menus. Uh, I actually, as part of this project, added in another command to create a tutorial template, which I'll talk about later. So if you could, uh, next slide, please. All right, so the next part of this was um, just thinking about the information architecture. So I will say I, I've worked in other technical writing jobs, uh, primarily for closed source software with one implementation essentially of that software. Thinking about information architecture for IPFS uh, is a lot different for me, uh, you know, because we have all these different tools. Um, there's all these different implementations, Kubo, JS, IPFS being two of them that don't necessarily have feature parity. Um, and then there's, you know, this whole decentralized nature of protocol labs, like uh, the team uh, developing, I think it's IRO, if I heard that correctly at IPFS camp, the uh, Rust implementation. I know there's interest in developing others. So just thinking about how do we organize all of that content? Um, you know, do we need multiple sites? Do we need one site? What's the best way to lay out menus? What's the best way to make sure that people can get to the information that they're looking for as quickly as possible without getting lost or frustrated. Um, so I mentioned, you know, that I got some feedback in Lisbon, had my launchpad experience, just random uh, conversations with peers in the couple of weeks that I've been here. Um, and then experience from previous jobs uh, has led me to the thought that it's like, okay, maybe we can look at different ways to uh, do the information architecture of the site. So I'll hopefully show this later if I have some time. Um, the approach that I took for a new layout on Hugo was, uh, first I'll say a three-dimensional navigation. And by that, uh, if you guys remember the IPFS doc site, currently there's a sidebar, um, and, uh, you know, sub items, and then some of the pages that are linked to some of those have menus, but not all of them do. So what I tried to enforce here was a top bar layout. It's logical categories, which are described below. Um, each of those top bars goes to an overview page with a sidebar of logical subcategories. Uh, and then, you know, there's there's menus automatically on every single page that are uh, basically created as a function of the header depth. Um, so, yeah, I mentioned menus by default. Um, I was trying to start thinking about the user persona. So am I a developer? Am I somebody trying to implement the protocol? Am I just, you know, a total noob like myself? I don't know really anything about Web3. I'm just trying to understand what the heck is IPFS. Um, I tried to uh, demonstrate the use of tabs over linear reading. So I'll give an example of this. Uh, when you set up IPFS desktop, you can set it up on Windows, Mac, uh, or uh, Linux, right? So in the current documentation, that's a linear read through. So different sections, you have to scroll through it or click down uh, to the section you're looking for. With tabs, pretty self-explanatory, just click the Windows tab and you'll only see that content. Uh, therefore, avoiding seeing other content you don't necessarily need to see or want to see. Um, the idea with the landing pages was that those should essentially serve as the directories for the top bar categories uh, to filter readers to the place they need to go. Um, so the top bar items I created were basics, reference, how-to, tutorials, and community. Uh, this is actually, I took inspiration from the Filecoin docs. Uh, basics is pretty self-explanatory. 
conceptual overview, quick starts, uh, brief overview of community stuff. Reference is uh, this was based on engineering uh, team feedback. Basically, the idea is to just have the HTTP gateway API reference in there and then possibly link out to like a Kubo specific site or a JS IPFS site. Although this disclaimer that's still very much up in the air, we're going to be having those conversations for a while. Um, a how to page, which is basically um, breaks down actions that you can perform with IPFS, like adding a file, right? And then so you have a tab view, how do I add a file in JS IPFS, Kubo, IPFS desktop, so on and so forth. Uh, and then tutorials, pretty self-explanatory. Um, so next, uh, next one. All right. Um, so I mentioned- Jay, Sorry to interrupt. We're just going to have to keep moving a little quicker if we can, just to get through in the interest of time. Sure, sure. Um, so real quick, um, the Johnny's uh, docs site allows for the uh, quick creation of templates. Uh, it's something called kinds in Hugo. Um, so as you can see from the screenshot right there, you just run a command. Um, and it'll create a tutorial template that was part of my project. Um, I'll link to the repo at the end. So if you want to take a look at it, you can look at it there. But it just automatically, automatically spits out a markdown document with a preformatted tutorial structure that you, as the uh, creator of that tutorial, can fill in the blanks. Um, next slide, please. All right. Uh, so just talking about automation, um, there's a lot of rules for markdown formatting. Uh, that vary across sites, uh, things like GitHub, Hugo, stuff like that. And uh, in the technical writer world, there's style guides. Uh, nobody wants to actually remember this stuff. It's really difficult to remember. So Dave, if you could skip to the next slide. Um, the answer is automation. So there's a couple tools, uh, Markdown Link Check, Markdown Lint, and Veil that I tested out here. If you could skip to the next slide, please. Um, the first one, Markdown Lint, is pretty self-explanatory. It uh, checks markdown structure and formatting, uh, formatting spaces, things like that, against a predefined set of rules. You can configure it yourself. Markdown Link Check, also very straightforward. It checks for bad links, uh, returns an error if there's a bad link found. Uh, next one. This is my favorite tool right here. So basically, it allows you to um, programmatically uh, assess a markdown document against the style guide, like the Microsoft style guide, um, spits out a bunch of warnings, uh, completely customizable, configurable. You can combine different style guides, different rule sets, things like that, create your own. So for example, you'll see an error in there that says, did you really mean Filecoin? In a custom version of this, we could have a set of um, uh, three, how do you say, words that um, are allowed. So Filecoin wouldn't return an error, things like that. Um, then there's things that are specific to, you know, writing. So if anybody remembers this from school, I don't remember half this stuff like passive voice, um, over active voice, uh, returns, you know, suggestions for that. Um, I think another great thing here that I'm a fan of is at the top, you'll see these weird numbers and statistics. Um, so if you're familiar, I think we have a lot of, a few former teachers here. So you, you all may have heard of the Flesh Kincaid grade level. Um, so it automatically runs uh, measures like that against the markdown document, which is, you know, potentially useful if you're trying to write like intro level material versus like a spec. Like if the spec is is uh, college level reading material, probably not a huge issue. But if the basics material is over like sixth grade, eighth grade, something like that, it's like, you know, maybe that's pointing to like, OK, let's let's rephrase this. Um, uh, if you could skip to the next slide, please. Um, so yeah, the, oh, sorry. So the, right. just to wrap it up, um, the lessons learned here, a couple things. Um, I'm a big fan of Johnny's product project, the uh, docs starter repo. Uh, we're going to continue iterating on that. A lot of fun things that we can do with that. Uh, we'd love, you know, to, for people to play around with it. Um, switching to Hugo, I think definitely has some benefits. Uh, I mentioned them earlier, things like rail refs, auto, uh, menu creation, themes, uh, a lot of folks in protocol labs already know Hugo pretty well. Um, and then, you know, just running through all of this gave uh, the docs team some good data for the docs as a service initiative. Um, information architecture, like I mentioned, it's a, it's definitely a non-trivial problem. We're gonna be talking about that for a while with engineering teams, different folks. Um, one big question, once again, is a single site versus multiple sites. Um, stay tuned for updates on that. Um, 
the tutorial template, I'm a big fan of things like that. You can imagine that we could expand that idea to other different types of content so that you can automatically create them. Uh, and then we can get, you know, community contributions that are uh, within a set of guardrails, essentially. So you have your template, fill in the blanks, boom. And then lastly, if you don't want to think about writing things, uh, the idea is, hey, here's, you know, a markdown linter, a link checker, and the style guide checker that when you're writing things, you know, if you're not a technical writer, which, you know, you don't need to be, that's the whole point. Um, you have all of these tools to uh, help you out essentially as you're writing. And one of the, my big goals in the next uh, month or so is to uh, start customizing all of those for uh, protocol labs. So uh, I probably don't have time to do a demo, but um, I'll, if anybody's interested, you know, just ping me after and happy to uh, show you the repo and stuff like that, because I'd love to get feedback and we'll definitely be iterating on this uh, at the technical writing team. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, James. Uh, that was great. Uh, I like Marco's idea. We might have a James Launchpad collaboration in the future. Sure. Um, quick background here. My name is Bo Brookstrom. I'm working on the Mosaic Working Group, which is in the services or spaceport team at PL. So our mission here on the Mosaic side is really this idea of building a marketplace. And the idea that we're going to do it on Web3 principles so that it can help PL to attract uh, the best and brightest minds of Web3. I think the real, there's kind of obviously two sides to this. One is trying to help those teams build better and faster. I think where the vision gets in, in gets more complicated is, you know, there are marketplaces out there, but if we can do it right, we can make sure that the other side is also incentivized to really be successful. And I'll let you guys read the vision on your own. If you can go to the next slide, Dave, I want to explain a little bit about this idea of matching versus marketplace versus ecosystem. So if you think about matching, what a lot of marketplaces do that aren't very, uh, how should I say, uh, effective from a business model standpoint is they just match up supply and demand. And so you have supply on one side, demand on the other, you match them up, that's liquidity. A great example here is Upwork. You know, they amassed a massive number of freelancers, had a lot of demand, but they didn't actually add a lot of value outside of that matching. And so what happens is they get disintermediated. There's no point on me doing my second and third project on Upwork once I've already met the person, I trust them and I like them. So I just pull it off there and then the freelancer's happy because they get more money and I'm happy because I don't have to use their system for communication. So that's kind of where a lot of people get stuck and die is, okay, we match, but they don't do much else. The next level down is marketplace, where you're actually adding a lot of value in the process before and after a match. And the great example here is Airbnb. So as a client who's looking for a house, you know, they help me not only find the house, but they do some quality control in there. For both sides, they provide a legal framework, a contract, payment processing, and then obviously on the supply side, they're by providing insurance and protection of your asset. So there's a lots of other value they're adding. The key idea here is before and after they're actually doing value add activities. The next level beyond that is an ecosystem where you get beyond just those two and you get other individuals involved uh, to add value as well. A great example would be developers. You know, if I have service providers on one side and I have PLN and PL teams on the other side, what about developers who are building tools who could help them work better together? What if I could get them involved in the relationship? What if I could get token holders involved who cared about the value of this token to, to really play an active role in governance and make sure that we're building an ecosystem that everybody is involved in and has a say? And as I looked around, the best example I could find is actually the point ecosystem. I think they've done a great job of building out a framework where everybody is incentivized and aligned. So that gets into kind of our goal is to build a similar ecosystem, not just a marketplace, but a true ecosystem where if I am a service provider, I'm not just trading my hours for money. I'm actually getting some state in there, some equity stake, some value beyond that that I care about. And then trying to do that same thing for clients, for ecosystem partners, for token holders and developers. Next slide, please. So learning so far, this is way more complex of a project than we originally thought. As just one example of that second point, there's a lot more stakeholders than we realized. You know, we identified service providers originally because that's who we were working with. Uh, but the example is one agency I talked to. Well, it turns out my contact agency is actually an independent contractor who basically is full time for them, but on the side is also a developer and developing a tool on a Web3 stack 
to help build websites faster. And so there's an example of an agency that's actually an independent contractor who's also a developer stakeholder. So it's just one example of the complexity here is much bigger than we originally realized. I think a second learning we've had so far is that the idea or the vision that is on that earlier slide, it really resonates with the service provider stakeholders. They are very frustrated with this life of, hey, I'm going to trade an hour of my time for a dollar and that's it. I get nothing else out of it. So I, it's, it's becoming more apparent that if we can build this, if we can overlay a marketplace with this ecosystem model and the incentive alignment, there is interest there. Next slide, please. So roadmap. Very quickly, I'll go through this. You know, we're still in the planning stages. We started jumping into the mapping and realized that we needed to slow down and kind of step back and get into the planning because it's it's just bigger and there's a lot more steps than we realized. So our hope is in Q1 to identify the stakeholders and really interview them, talk with them, understand what they each want. Um, then really build out the alignment map in Q2 to try and align each stakeholder and map out those relationships and what happens between each one. I think Q3 is going to be pretty pivotal in terms of modeling. You know, there are, there are organizations out there that do pretty extensive modeling. We're hoping to work with one of them. I think one of the things I didn't understand up front was the importance of figuring out how people can game our incentive model and try to identify ways to prevent that abuse. And then the goal is in Q4 to actually overlay that incentive model onto the marketplace that we build between now and then. Next slide, please. So current status, like I mentioned, still in the planning stages. I think the biggest challenge I've got is just time, you know, and specifically the, the kind of catch-22 of priorities. So on the team itself, we're currently actively trying to build a marketplace where you know we're matching up supply with demand and adding value along the way. That in and of itself is a full-time job and oftentimes feels more urgent than this idea of you know, creating an incentive model, which is still a very amorphous idea. I think the, the irony is that if we do that right, it's actually more valuable in some ways than just building a marketplace because an ecosystem is is a bigger vision and adds more value for everybody involved, but it's just the harder one to kind of keep moving forward little by little. So we're definitely feeling that catch 22 challenge right now. That's all I've got. Thanks, Bo. Um, sounds great. And uh, that was a uh, very efficiently delivered too. Um, <laughs> very, very cool. Okay, so uh, we're gonna talk about um, meta transactions. Um, and uh, uh, some some important things to um, mention around them. Uh, they're based off of um, EIP uh, 2771. These are um, Ethereum uh, improvement proposals. And um, essentially what you're doing is you're, uh, you're signing a transactions, a transa or sorry, you're signing a message from one uh, user. And in that message, the user specifies who they trust to relay that transaction uh, to a smart contract to be um, settled. And so the forwarder um, is paying for that transaction. And this is all kind of worked out, uh, been worked out in a secure way um, through this EIP. Um, the important part to know here is that the smart contract is verifying that the uh, forwarder is um, sending the right signature and that signature has the original sender's address in it along with the forward forwarder's address. And through that, you can kind of verify that this is a, a secure transaction, the original signer meant to do this. Um, another, another EIP to mention here is uh, 712. Uh, this is essentially um, a lot of this, you know, it adds um, security and uh, a, a good user experience because uh, you typically with your transactions, when they pull up in MetaMask, they, um, or any other wallet, they do not present, you know, the data is just one long hex string. Uh, hexadecimal string, and um, it's not very uh, readable. Um, so that's what EIP 712 does, is it actually presents a message inside of your wallet before you sign it so that you can know what you're signing. Um, 
it, it does that uh, through like a base domain uh, <clears throat> signature. And so this is sort of a uh, security uh, practice um, that essentially the wallet will check that one, you're talking to the right contract. So if you see number four there, it's the uh, verifying contract. So um, if you're talking to the wrong contract, then the wallet will actually um, indicate that um, and, and kind of warn you against that. Uh, another really important one is chain ID. Um, the thing that you really have to be worried about with these types of transactions are um, uh, typically it's, it's replay attacks, which means that the signature can be used uh, over and over again. Um, chain ID prevents relay attacks on other chains. So some of these transactions would be uh, or could be valid on different blockchains that use the same wallet and signing schemes. Um, unless you add the chain ID in there and then the wallets will um, not allow that um, transaction to go through. And so there's some other, other things with the domain signing, um, but that's sort of like the initial part of the 712 signature. The other part is defined by each transaction. So this is like the custom data that you, that you see in the message here. And uh, for this, we've got the owner, which is the original signer. We've got the trusted relayer, uh, which is who I'm trusting to pay for my transaction. And then we have the nonce. Um, the nonce prevents replay attacks in the same uh, contract uh, because what you do is you bump a nonce. So if it's at zero and you, or in this case, it's at seven, if once the transaction goes through, that goes to eight. Uh, that invalidates the, that signature and that transaction from ever happening again. Um, uh, yeah, I think I'm just gonna, this is sort of like a simplified version of the contract here. The most important part is that we are uh, passing in the signature, which is the three parameters here. Uh, we're recovering the user from that, and then we're checking that against the owner um and uh yeah so that is essentially how the contract is maintaining the security of a uh, original signer um signer's transaction being paid by another uh person or entity um yeah so we're using i'm using lib p2p uh web rtc to make these connections in the app um this is just kind of a breakdown of some of the code and handlers i won't stay on that much um and now i will pull up the demo so i'm uh i've got uh, two windows open here. Um, there, uh, one is running on port 3000, one is running on uh, 3001. Um, and uh, what we're going to do here is start some lib P2P nodes. So the only thing that you really have to know about this app is I'm submitting an address to the contract. So I'm submitting this address to the contract through uh, this uh, relayer. Um, and so if I'm registering, I'm going to start a node. And this is uh, called the dialer in libp2p. Um, and then this node is going to be the listener. It's going to uh, listen for um, the data that I'm passing it. So this will load up, it, it, they each have their own uh, node, they each have their own peer ID. You would do this offline. So like if me and Dave are, are doing this transaction together, I would like pass him this information on Discord and then he would, uh, and then I would connect to his node. And um, let's just see if this, oh, let me restart. Here, let me, 
let me pull up the video I recorded earlier because I think it's not running right. Brian, maybe you could also share this uh, video recording in, in the in chat. Yeah. Um, that yeah, way. so I, I will. I, I recorded this just before the talk, just in case this happened. So, um, so here we are, we're uh, adding the um, peer ID and the um, connection address. And uh, let me just skip forward here. Okay, here we go. Okay, so you'll see that the message passed over here, and this is now waiting for me to send uh, the signature. Uh, so I'm gonna go over to the app on the left. I'm gonna grab my wallet here. Um, that is gonna be my trusted relayer. We're gonna <clears throat> sign this transaction. So we should see that pop up over here and you can see that image from earlier. Um, we've got the trusted relayer and the owner is this user's wallet right here. So we've created a signature and I'm just showing you the uh, what that looks like right there. That's, that's the signature that we're gonna pass to the smart contract. First, we're gonna pass that signature over to uh, the user on the left. And once they receive that, they will um, sign and pay that. So basically this is, he's paying for the, oh, sorry. This uh, user on the left is paying for this transaction to go through. Uh, and sending that signature we saw earlier to the smart contract. And I think I'm just showing here that the signature was received uh, by this user on the left. So it's the same signature. And then we will pay for that. And um, you can see that settled right there. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's it. All the kind of communications done through lib P2P and it's basically you're passing, uh, data from one peer to another in order to facilitate a meta transaction. That's great. Thanks, Brian. Um, Dan and Elliot are next. Um, all right. Well, yeah, I'm Elliot and I did this collab with Dan uh, I'm helping to lead the Ignite engineering team. So that's IPFS GUI and tools, and that includes IPFS desktop and web UI. So our project is an IPFS search integration into those um, applications, web apps. And um, yeah, let's go to the next. So IPFS search is a way to discover content on the distributed web. So when you uh, start using IPFS, there's not an easy way to find out what is available there. Um, by the way, uh, as I'm sure you all know, web UI is um, what IPFS desktop is built on. And these apps are the primary entry points for new IPFS users. So it's very easy to um, you know, just run IPFS desktop, you get a Kubo node automatically, and, it, and you can start interacting with IPFS right away. Um, in these apps right now, you have to kind of know a CID or have a way to um, look up uh, what you want. <clears throat> but with IPFS search, you can actually discover new IPFS content, old content, any content. Uh, it's really a search engine that tries to index everything that is uh, in the DHT, everything that's on the network. And that enables you to better appreciate the value of all the data that exists on IPFS. So as mentioned, I'm Elliot. I did this uh, together with Dan and a special thanks to Russell, Frito, uh, uh, Matthias, Lytle, and Julia for their help as well. Uh, so I, I think I'll pass it over to Dan. Hey, thanks, Elliot. Um, yeah, you can go to the next slide too, I think. Um, so this was kind of covered as well, but 
Yeah, basically this idea was kind of born from, I'm pretty sure a uh, interaction between IPFS search team and Russell in Lisbon about um, kind of trying to expand uh, the reach of IPFS uh, search. So um, I can actually, uh, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, I guess instead I'll just do a quick demo so I can take over. Um, but yeah, this basically it was, uh, the goal here was to create like a proof of concept for um, for integrating IPFS search into the, the current web UI. Um, and you can see Chrome, I'm hoping. Um, but yeah, so basically this is, for those of you who haven't seen it, I hope everyone at this point has seen the IPFS uh, web UI, but this is just like the main page. So what we did um, kind of as a V0 is just add a new tab to the nav for um, essentially spinning up a, a IPFS search within uh, the web UI. So here, like everything behind the scenes is, is kind of powered by IPFS search's API. Um, and right now, what's happening behind the scenes is we're just indexing uh, all of IPFS for, in this case, like NASA. Um, and so what we can do here is currently like explore the CID, which is already existing within IPFS uh, web UI. This should pull up, hopefully. Um, yeah. And then if we go back to search, we can also link out to the IPFS search um, details page. So hopefully this should spin up a on IPFS search.com's uh, detailed page if it works. Um, my computer is super slow, but let's see. Yeah, so basically it's a pretty simple demo and proof of concept, but um, we were able to essentially uh, uh, pull in the IPFS search into the web UI and kind of, uh, I guess, next steps. Katie, I guess you can share again. Um, I'll stop sharing. Yeah, I can take over. I or, think I, or Dave. Yeah. I, I was going to that audio. I know Frito had some questions as well. He jumped in specifically to ask you, Dan, about that. Okay. Yeah, we can um, uh, basically, yeah, for, for us, the next steps are, are really just collaborating further with uh, everyone that we've been working with over the last week and like, cleaning up the, the UX and UI. And uh, there's a lot of functionality that IPFS search um, has in their application that we could try and bring into to ours as well, like pagination. Um, you can play uh, pretty much from ipfssearch.com. You could queue up an entire playlist of audio and um, listen to, to music that's stored on IPFS. So there's a lot of really cool things um, that can be done in the future here. So, yeah. I don't know if Elliot, you had any, any other comment? Yeah, I think that uh, kind of covers it. Uh, we did have a fun discussion on GitHub about uh, kind of the future of IPFS search and decentralizing it more um, uh, using libp2p, kind of ways to make sure that users can access it, even if there's some, uh, for example, DNS censorship. And uh, and then, yeah, just deeper integration and, uh, you know, kind of improving the, uh, the way that users actually um, do a search in web UI. Thanks, Dan and Elliot. Um, I don't really sorry, I don't really have questions, but uh, it was very nice demo. Very nice to see uh, Dan and Elliot, and uh, looking forward to uh, collaborating more about this. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for all the the help throughout the last week. Sure. Yeah, thanks, and uh, a perfect live example of uh, some of the really cool collaboration that comes from these projects. And um, thanks, Frida, for uh, for helping the guys out. Um, I think we've got the sound sorted. We'll give uh, we'll give Po Chun's video another try here. Hello, everyone. This is Po Chun. I'm going to talk about my launchpad project around hacking Lady Data Store and performance improvement. So, in case people don't know, Lady is a wrapped Lotus node designed specifically for indexing the Filecoin blockchain. So, here's the current architecture. So, you can see there's a Lily notifier that's syncing data from the Filecoin network and inserting the task into a task queue. Now be consumed by a set of lady workers. The task defines how we 
extract, transform, and load blockchain data into a destination, which is usually our data warehouse. There's a couple of downsides with the current design. Uh, first of all, since every worker node is a independent Lotus node, uh, when we want to add a new worker to the pool, we need to wait for it to be fully in sync with the Falcon network. Second, since the, each worker node is doing the network syncing as well as the data extraction, we need a pretty high-end hardware spec um, in order to handle the workload. So this makes uh, running too many workloads um, expensive. So in order to make this design more scalable and easier to maintain, um, I thought about a new architecture proposal. So here's a new design. So instead of using a local disk as a data store, uh, we use a distributed data store that will be shared across the Lady Notifier and Lady Workers. So Lady Notifier will be responsible for syncing the Filecoin network data to the data store. And the Lady Workers will only need to focus on extracting data from the distributed data store. This makes the Lady Worker uh, stay less, more lightweight, and easier to scale up. Also, the distributed cache can be shared across all the nodes, um, and uh, both the cache and data store can be scaled up uh, independently. So I've, I've implemented the prototype to use S3 as the distributed data store, and the Redis as the distributed cache. But then I realized that um, there's a lot of room for performance improvement in the leading code base. So I decided to pursue that in that direction. So I look at the Lily production dashboard to find out what are the most expensive tasks. So we can see that um, most of the expensive ones are minor sector related. So when I look at the tracing for a certain um, sector event task, I notice that in some cases there will be um, one miners that's taking a lot of time to extract data. So when I investigate further, I notice that it's because um, the miner has a lot of sectors, more than two millions in this case. So what I did um, to the code is to um, make it more performant. So the trick is instead of using a two-way merge for a bit rate, I use a multi-merge. Um, to merge all the sector states in the end. So this significantly uh, cut down the runtime by more than half. So the result, uh, the runtime for the task reduced from 50 seconds to 30 seconds. So another performance fix I did um, is to get rid of an actor code mapping in the code. So Lily tries to construct an actor code lookup table for every epoch. So actor code, and it's just a code that indicates the type of actor. So for every epoch, Lily will loop through the state tree, uh, usually with 1.5 million actors to build the lookup table. So this process will take 40 seconds without uh, any caching um, and 10 seconds with uh, state store caching. However, once we build that lookup table, it's only used for a couple hundred times um, within a task, which just doesn't justify the cost of building this table. So after I remove that um, lookup table, um, I reduce the task runtime from 48 seconds without cache to 16 seconds with cache. Then uh, now it's, it only takes 8.5 seconds to finish that task. Right, that's um, all I have. Thanks. Um, cool, thanks, uh, Po Chun. Um, sorry wasn't able to make it, but I'm glad he was able to share his video. Um, I think Marco is going to take over screen share as he has what was um, a little bit of a later submission from Sarah. Yep. The FPM DX team to the How's audio? The early builders dashboard that I have done for. Yep, that's good. Uh, what you got. So uh, really quickly, for those of you who have not known or heard about the early builders program for FEM, it's a little bit different in the sense that it's uh, focused on early builders building with the product being incrementally delivered rather than building on. Um, this is just a really quick capture of how the program runs. Uh, I'm just going to leave it here. But TLDR, um, 
they come in and they go through weekly check-ins with us and then eventually they graduate. Um, it's not a hard explicit outcome that we want them to deliver a product on FEM at the end of the cohort, uh, but we highly encourage it and we bring them a lot of resources and bring them much closer to the PR and resources to do so. Um, coming out of it, they then go straight into launching their product uh, or helping us to run community calls. Uh, if they are more of a community member than a team and or and or they then join the builders funnel. So um, what are the useful metrics in this case? So the goals of the dashboard is to capture a snapshot of how the program is going, probably a biweekly cadence or monthly cadence is something that we're trying to figure out now. Um, it then helps us to optimize early builders program for deployment of FEVM because at the end of the day, we want them to deploy the EVM compatible FEM. Uh, we want to see actors on the network. And so how do we make sure that, you know, progress is moving along and how can we use a dashboard to capture that? Um, also making sure that they have great developer experience because they are going to be the best advocates for us the moment the product launches, uh, the moment FEM launches. So we need to make sure that that is going well um, and also to capture the value of the program as a whole. Challenges that we faced, that I faced building this was defining metrics. Um, you know, the team had a little bit of a huddle to, to come together, um, but it was a little bit challenging to know what we should be measuring that would be useful metrics, especially when there's not a hard um, expected outcome at the end of the program. Uh, lack of visibility into team's progress was also a challenge because, you know, teams communicate in very different ways and have very different transparency um, com comfort level. So we might not actually know what they're building, but how then we, do we know that they're progressing along? Um, also figuring out automation for the dashboard. A lot of this is very subjective information uh, and also sometimes word of mouth, right? Um, so learnings is to have really strong relationship building and communication with these teams um, and making sure that they feel like they can share what they're doing with you um, rather than, you know, you'll never find out from their GitHub or their website alone. We also tried crowdsourcing team inputs, but that was also learning for us that, um, you know, that just leads to a lot of inconsistency. So it gives us a sense, but then we also have to research and make sure that it's consistent um, so that when the reader reads it, they get value out of it, out of the dashboard as a whole. Next up, we are looking at, you know, after this, how do we update, what's the update cadence for the dashboard, um, sharing the dashboard, the dashboard with relevant stakeholders and seeing how it provides value and then being agile uh, with that and also with FEM developing as it goes along to then change the metrics that we capture. So I'll do a really quick demo of the dashboard over here. Okay. Cool. Uh, here you can see total teams is about 89 teams as of now, 89 active teams. We have about 20 projects with uh, FEVM deployed as of today. So then you can tell like that's maybe something we should be nudging a little bit more on. Uh, we have 14 teams that are funded. That's something that we're looking at for sustainability beyond the program if they are tied in with a DEF grant or into the builder's funnel. Uh, this gives a sense of the percentage of use cases. So for our product, FEM product team especially, we'll know like which are the use cases that are key. Uh, so you'll know like, yeah, data dials are a pretty big uh, use case and maybe that's something we should prioritize. And then of course, there are many more over here. And then you know who to ask to help build out your solution blueprint. Um, over here is, this is estimating engagement. This was highly subjective based on someone like me who's a program lead, giving like a score of how I think engagement has been going at the weekly check-ins versus on the Slack channels and so on. Um, so it's just a sense, but it gives us a sense that, okay, I need to know that maybe I want to shift it more to the three and fours rather than them being at the twos. And maybe for those teams that are at the twos, how do I ping them to make sure that um, they're doing okay and, and they're engaged, right? Um, and then testing over here is more for our product team and our engineering team. So for stuff that is going out, um, making sure that that's captured. And if, if anything that needs to be tested is not on here, that's something that we know that we need to start having a conversation on and asking for volunteers. And then lastly, around expertise, uh, kind of getting a sense of the languages that everyone's working with. So we know what to prioritize when we're building our SDKs. And also if we need experts to test on certain things, we know who to reach out to. So yeah, that is mostly the demo. Um, thanks. Cool. Thanks, uh, Sarah, Marco, for your help there. Uh, so just some quick background on me. I <clears throat> am on the Spaceport team at Protocol Labs. We provide uh, services and resources to teams within the Protocol Labs network from events like Lab Week to uh, onboarding processes into the network and sharing all of the different resources that Protocol Labs has to help these teams grow more quickly. Um, and one common question that we get quite a bit is it's difficult to 
uh, find people who can answer a particular question about a PL project or a PL team, especially on the technical side. So for example, if I have a question on uh, lib P2P, who do I ask, where do I go? For me, I have the amazing Launchpad team here, but if I am brand new to the network, have not done Launchpad yet, what do I do? Um, and the solution that we have for now is the PLN directory and office hours. So you'll see some screenshots here. Uh, for those who have not seen the directory yet, I highly recommend you check it out. I'll put it in the chat after this call. But it is a place to see all the teams within the Protocol Labs network, as well as who is in those, uh, who's a member, what their role is, and their uh, contact information, even uh, for some people, a direct link to their calendar to set up office hours. And so in this case, say I want, you can search for teams in the search bar up here. Let's say I want to look for libp2p. I would get a result for the libp2p stewards team that has recently been added in. You can see their website, their Twitter, a little bit more about them, and more importantly, some of the members here. I will caveat that this is an incomplete list and still a work in progress, but looking here, I can much more easily find that Steve is the <clears throat> lead for this team. And he actually has an office hours link uh, available. So I can schedule a quick 15 minute chat to reach out to him and say, hey, here's the question that I have. Um, these are the list of teams that have now been added to the PLN directory on the left-hand side. Uh, so the Launchpad team, thanks everyone for this, uh, as well as most of the engineering teams. Um, the reason, I wanted to focus on the engineering working groups is because these are the most kinds of questions that we have that we don't have, uh, that my team doesn't have a quick answer to. Uh, working groups that will be added by the end of this month are all listed here. And the V2 vision for this is that each working group will have a full list of members added and that each working group will also have a preferred contact method listed so that some of the messages that don't need to go to individuals can go to a shared uh, message board or email and can get responded to more quickly. Um, quick ask for this group is, if you see your working group here, please check it out at plnetwork.io slash directory. You can use that same search bar. And if something looks off, uh, please use the request to edit button. And if you have any feedback, please share it with me at spaceport-admin at protocol.ai. Thanks, Denise. Um, super helpful resource uh, to keep up with all the changes and where everything's located. Um, we've got Yuri up next. He was not able to make the call today. Oh, wait, Yuri is on the call. But his uh, he submitted a video recording, um, which I will play now. Doesn't have a mic today. No worries, Yuri. We've got, we've got your presentation here. Um, Hello, everyone. My name is Yuri. I am a software engineer from Piranha. Uh, first, a little about my main project. Most Web3 projects today exchange most of the community knowledge between users in different messengers like Discord, Telegram, and Slack. And information is not searchable and doesn't have a structure. Basically, it's not usable, but those channels store lots and lots of information. For example, uh, we did the analysis of Filecoin Slack channels and we found 380 channels, and this is impressive. We didn't see a typical solution to this problem for big web free organizations like Filecoin. And for someone who is not familiar with Piranha, this is our mission to build an effective knowledge base protocol uh, specifically focused on web three communities. Uh, the protocol itself is fully decentralized, built on the blockchain using Filecoin APFS. Uh, all of the content is stored in a distributed way and owned by the community itself and also provides different uh, incentives to contribute in form of tokens and different NFTs like a reward. And we are working now on collaboration with the coin network to reward users with attention tokens as well. So uh, during the launch part, I was working on uh, community documentation. Uh, Piranha gives various Web3 communities the opportunity to create a separate subdomain dedicated exclusively to this community with their own topics for discussions uh, and rules of conduct. Uh, previously, in the past, there was only an FAQ page, which is, was not a flexible enough tool to introduce new users to the philosophy of a particular community. Uh, 
And we had an idea to implement a dynamic documentation system, like similar to Gitbook, but decentralized. Uh, now we have finished the documentation menu, start on the IPFS, indexing with the graph and um, like moderators and administrators of the community can create or edit the whole documentation section with only one transaction. The main problem with the previous version was the necessity of sending the transaction each time you create or edit any documentation item. It was too long and creating complex documentation was too hard. Uh, there is an editing mod in the current version and all changes are saved on the local storage and only after publish, publishing the JSON document uh, with new documentation, uh, it will be saved on IPFS and hash will be stored in the blockchain. On this slide, uh, you can see how the documentation uh, menu looks on the page. Uh, and have um, this the editing mode. After clicking save to draft, you can see how the documentation looks like. Without sending transaction, you can add text, you can um, change title, you can do anything you want. Uh, like, no, uh, create new posts, edit old, old posts, and um, also change the item order. Uh, so, a little bit about the format. It was also pretty challenging to create the graph parser for such a big JSON structure. Uh, on the left image, uh, you can see how the documentation object looks on the front end part, on the draft, uh, before sending to the IPFS. The right image is the same JSON object, but passed by the graph. Uh, and also you can see that uh, the main item information, like documentation content, are also packed to IPFS. And uh, in this structure, we have only hashes. Uh, so very soon, this uh, functionality will be deployed in production and will be used by community moderators. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thanks, Yuri. Um, thanks for sharing that. Very cool to see Piranha. Um, Hello, everyone. There we go. Uh, in another cohort and uh, building upon um, your tech in Launchpad. Uh, Snow's up next. So hi, my name is Snow. I started off with a project of what scaling Notion would look like for Launchpad in 2023. So to be completely honest, we can go to my first slide. I started... Uh, not knowing anything about Notion. And I purposely picked using this tool or having it as a part of one of my responsibilities because I did really want to learn. And so basically what I started off with my goal is what is Notion gonna look like when we have multiple running cohorts in parallel? And like, how can we make this a more accessible, super useful tool for, for all residents and cohorts going forward? And in the beginning, I was noticing some challenges of just, you know, this is a big learning curve for me. It's a new project um, and also being a contractor, there was some permission issues that I was having, but actually as I've gone through and we can go to the next slide, I have started just researching, reading, making progress of what's going on. And the thing I kept hearing again from my team or hearing from others is automation and how can we make notion for us in Launchpad, how can we automate things? Because we're going to be growing, we're going to be having multiple cohorts, more residents, even doubling those numbers in 2023 for the goals that we have. And so as I was looking through, I actually just realized like things are happening really fast and features are actually coming all the time that this is a constant learning opportunity for me to find out what is new. For example, like recurring templates is something that just came out that I've found videos about this month, November. Um, it's kind of like not as, as easy as like a recurring task feature yet, but it's something that Notion is hoping to make as a building block for the future. So on the bottom corner, you can kind of see that there's templates uh, that you can upload a template and make it come out at a certain date. But I'm wondering what that would look like for the future of making full on tasks that we're doing and we're using for Launchpad. Next slide, please. And so... As I think about it more, what does Launchpad need to be automated as we scale? As I've been going through this, especially from just joining the first cohort as a resident participant and kind of observer, and now finally with, you know, V7 starting this week and actually jumping into the tasks and tools that I was put responsible for, it's those resident profiles, the resident checklists, the templates that we're continuously using. Um, what happens when we have more than one cohort and they're not running in and they're not running in parallel? How do we make sure that that is making sense? 
And rather than moving from a manual copying pasting uh, to more to formulas, discovering new features and automation. So that's all I got. That's great. Thanks for sharing, Snow. And uh, everybody in here has engaged with uh, the Launchpad Notion pages. So uh, very useful and, uh, and helpful um, for current and future cohorts. And the last presentation of cohort V6 is show me what you've got. We've got Robert next. Um, so uh, hello, everyone. I know we're over time, so I will keep it brief. Uh, it's amazing to see so many great projects, and I know I will be using many of them. Uh, and even more impressive is uh, how many are in the demo stage already, and I'm very, very uh, impressed. So um, my name's Robert. I manage the Orbit program uh, here at the Filecoin Foundation. And what I'm looking to do is automate many of the internal Orbit processes and then also demonstrate a number of Filecoin virtual machine use cases. So uh, maybe we go to the next slide. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, the Orbit program is the Filecoin Community Ambassador Program. There are over 70 ambassadors in as many countries all over the world. And more or less, uh, you know, Orbit's been misdiagnosed as an events program because we spend money on events, but uh, these ambassadors not only hold, host events, but they translate documentation uh, and publish articles about Filecoin in their home languages. Uh, they build on Filecoin, uh, you know, a, a number of different things uh, that they are involved with. Um, and it's really, really amazing to see how the program has grown. It started in January and the participation keeps going up and up and up. Uh, okay, maybe the next slide. Um, so uh, on the previous slide, you saw a bunch of uh, maybe charts. Um, when I got, came to the Orbit uh, program, everything was being done manually. Uh, more or less, people would submit their event briefs via email. We would transcribe their proposals into spreadsheets. And uh, there's a number of situations that we have to email invoices and, and contracts. And uh, it's just a totally out of control, very time consuming process. And you can imagine if we want to scale, uh, the Orbit staff should have to do none of that. So uh, we are transitioning to a program called Airtable uh, or software called Airtable. Um, and more or less, we spent uh, a couple of weeks mapping out what the process is from applying as a volunteer to join Orbit all the way through uh, getting an event approved and having to submit the receipts. Um, so this is more or less the automated process that Airtable is going to manage including sending out automated emails and uh, to invoices and, and contracts and all of the like. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, so where this is relevant for the Filecoin virtual machine is that these Orbit members actually have a ranking and we're trying to pit them in competition. So there's some gamification to keep them active. Um, and what we want to do is actually use Orbit as a demonstration of three Filecoin virtual machine use cases, uh, reputation, rewards, and voting. Um, so more or less what's going to happen is we have the Airtable, that's the logo all the way on the right uh, on your screen. We have all the Airtable basically managing all the processes and we get really amazing data from Airtable. We're then going to use another software which is coincidentally called Orbit, uh, not to confuse everyone. Um, and that is where we're going to actually track user partic like volunteer participation and their ranking. And then we're going to uh, get that into a Filecoin virtual machine smart contract somehow. Okay, next slide and last slide. So the Filecoin virtual machine, our smart contracts, we are in the design stage. Um, so this is more or less what the process kind of looks like. So we'll have the input uh, participation data from the Airtable, and that will get basically processed in the Orbit software, which will then compute the ranking uh, of the um, Orbit members. We will then have some type of smart contract rank tracker that associates that rank with the members 
um, Filecoin addresses. And then uh, more or less, uh, basically two things will happen. First, uh, we'll have some type of token uh, system where they receive tokens for ranking up and then they could use those tokens, send them to a foundation wallet to redeem some type of perk. For example, if you get to the third highest rank, you actually unlock, uh, the foundation will pay for them to come to a fill event as an example. So maybe there's some type of NFT uh, that represents that perk that we issue to them upon them getting to that rank. And then they send it to the foundation wallet to redeem it. And then they are, we you know send them the compensation to be able to pay for their flight and hotel and all this stuff. Um, the other, so that's more or less uh, the uh, reputation and rewards. So that's how that would work. Uh, and then, um, you know, there's this idea that there would be a yearly orbit summit. And uh, we thought maybe the highest ranked people will be able to vote on who has to host the yearly, which orbit member will host the yearly summit. Um, so we actually have an anonymous election smart contract uh, voting machine um, that I actually uh, use as a homework assignment when I am teaching uh, software classes, such as the one over the summer we did for CoRISE. But this works on Ethereum. Uh, it's really interesting because it has some cryptography involved that actually hides people's votes. Um, but we want to migrate this over to the Filecoin virtual machine. And more or less, uh, we will have some type of automated process where uh, people that are ranked three and ranked four their wallet addresses will automatically, when we want to generate an election, uh, those wallet addresses will automatically come into the election and be earmarked as valid wallet addresses to vote. And then they will vote using their private key uh, on whatever it is they're voting on. Um, so uh, those are the three use cases we're looking to build. I'm hoping to do it by the Filecoin Virtual Machine global hackathon that's happening at the end of November. Um, the Airtable luckily is in the build stage with our partners uh, that we have, uh, we have like a third party consulting group that's helping us build that out. Um, the rewards and reputation are in the design stage and the voting, uh, we need to migrate from Ethereum to Filecoin virtual machine. So I just want to thank Sarah Thiem, who has been very generous in her uh, time. This has been maybe the most unlikely collaborations between an ambassador program and uh, the Filecoin virtual machine team, but um, I will definitely be leaning on her greatly for uh, bringing this to life. And I also wanna thank Elijah J Jasso, who was uh, a TA and a course I used to teach who brought the voting machine uh, to life. So, okay, thank you so much. And uh, I'm looking forward to delivering this in the next couple of weeks, so. Very cool, thanks Robert. Um... Cool to see those stats about where in the world uh, events are taking place. Um, thank you, everybody. And uh, that brings our presentations to a close and your final, almost your final launchpad task complete. Um, and with that, we have a cohort being launched into the network. Um, you're going to go forth and do more wonderful things. And these preview uh, presentations we saw today um, were an incredible mix of uh of creations and ideas and talent from across the network so um really cool to um to see what everyone's been uh been working on over the past six weeks and and uh working on moving forward before we throw those graduation caps james um there is one last task and that is to take out your phone scan that qr code throw your votes in um as if you don't have enough swag from Lisbon, the winners will be receiving more swag. Um, and uh, there's the categories on the left, um, contributions, technical contributions, collaborations, most valuable. Um, we'll tally these today, share them tomorrow during our final weekly sync. And um, then we'll bid you uh, farewell into the, into the ecosystem. Um, but, we will definitely be calling you back. Uh, we have such a cool collaboration of talents in here. And um, in order to build 
uh, launch pad and improve it. And uh, we'll probably be calling upon your talents to revisit future cohorts. Um, I do want to once again, thank all of the launch pad team um, for uh, the work over the past six weeks. And I didn't mention it earlier. Um, big shout out to all the mentors um, who who played a integral role and they always do um, in in guiding um, our cohort residents um, through the six weeks and uh, graduates is that a word um, people who are going to graduate uh, we will likely ask you to be mentors in the future too possibly um, lastly if you completed all the quizzes at the end of each section of the curriculum and now having completed your project presentations you are entitled to a 30 NFT. So look out for an email. Um, that should be coming your way once those tasks are all complete and projects have been shared like they were today. Um, and I think that brings our show me what you've got to a close. Another reminder to vote. And now it's up to you. Um, thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. And um, See you tomorrow, actually, I guess before the weekend for the announcing of those votes. Uh, thanks again for all your hard work on this. Have a great day.